Marketing and Communications Manager at Data Conversion Laboratory, and I will be your moderator today. Before we get started, I wanted to let you know we will allow time at the end of the webinar for questions and answers, so please write your questions in the chat area as they come to mind. If we don't have time to answer them all, we will make them available on our website. Next slide, please. For those of you who are not familiar with DCL, we convert and organize content to create electronic documents, populate databases, publish on the web, and basically get it ready for tomorrow's technology. Next slide, please. DCL services help you refine your document conversion strategy, identify document redundancy, extract metadata, and transform legacy and future documents for real needs, today and in the future. Next slide, please. These DCL's client base, we serve a broad client base. Next slide, please. Spanning all industries. <clears throat> Today, we are thrilled to introduce Autumn Squella, Associate Product Manager, and Aaron Geiger, Business Development Manager, both of Design Science. Autumn is the Associate Product Manager at Design Science, where she works with publishers, engineers, educators, and programs to implement math, ML, and XML publishing workflows. Before joining Design Science, Autumn was a researcher at the University of Auckland in New Zealand, developing cell, cell ML and XML language for describing biological models and associated metadata and ontologies. <clears throat> Aaron is the business development manager at Design Science. His primary focus is to build awareness around, around math ML and Design Science's math flow software. He gets fired up about math and is excited to work with content strategists to learn their processes and challenges. Aaron graduated from Lawrence University of Appleton, Wisconsin with a BA majoring in computer science and mathematics. Without further ado, welcome Autumn and Aaron. Thanks for the introduction, uh, Adam. I really appreciate it. That, that was very nice. Uh, so before we get started, I want to talk a little bit about who Design Science is now that you know a little bit about who we are. Uh, Design Science was established in 1987 and our software focuses on easily communicating scientific notation, whether that means editing, displaying, or making accessible math content. We're leaders in developing the MathML standard for the, uh, with the W3C, uh, and if there was ever a MathML company out there, uh, that would probably be, be us. Uh, our, we have two main pieces of software that we work with. Uh, MathType is our software that is usually used by individuals and some of the reasons that people might use it would be to write scientific papers or in a classroom setting, um, also to create homework sheets and, and do your math homework, things like that. Our math flow product is used by software companies and technical publication departments to add MathML to their software and their documents. Uh, all in all, our software is used by over 2 million people worldwide uh, with all sorts of different types of software to work with math and hundreds of different products. We have a large partner network with integrations into the big names in XML publishing software. So we're partners with companies like Adobe, Synchrosoft, and Just Systems. So when you need to add math to your data documents, typically we're able to work with your current CMS or XML authoring tool to, to help make that happen. Today we're going to talk a little bit about the new specializations in Data 1.3. And they're broken up into two separate but related parts. I'll be talking about MathML and the MathML specializations in Data. These specializations have to do with the XML elements that will be added to data that will be legal, and I'm planning on talking about what MathML is, why it's important, and how to do some of the external referencing. Autumn's going to talk about the equation specializations. She's going to talk about the general way that equations can be added to your documents, and you're going to hear about things like equation numbering and block versus inline formatting. Finally, we're going to get into some of the different MathML outputs and output methods. So I'm going to go ahead and pass it over to Autumn so that she can tell you a little bit more about the equation specialization. Thank you, Erin. Um, yes, I will be talking about our equation specialization. This is the one of the two new math specializations in DITA 1.3. The equation specialization provides information on how the equation should be placed or formatted within your document. So for example, should the equation be set off from the rest of the text or in line with the rest of the text? Should it have equation numbers or should it have captions and so on? 
The equation specialization is format agnostic, which means that your equations can be represented as MathML, as SVG, as a tech or a LaTeX string, or as a bitmap image such as a PNG, just as, um, to give you a few examples. In fact, the new equation specialization does allow one to specify variant formats for the same equation. So um, you could have a bitmap image and a MathML string representing the same equation. But I do want to caution you, if you do happen to go that route and include multiple variants, just um, be careful because there is nothing to say uh, which one takes precedence should there be any mismatch between those equations. So for example, if we had a, a bitmap image that has one half in it and then a MathML string that says one third, there's no way to tell really unless you um, implement your own policy as to which one should be the, the correct one. Now let's get into the details of the equation specialization just a little bit. Um, the, the DITA specification recognizes two main equation types. One is the inline equation. Um, that's the first one. And as you might be able to glean from the name of it, this is for the equations that are in line with the surrounding text, such as in this example. This is represented by the equation dash inline tag in DITA 1.3. And this is, um, can be used whenever, wherever a DITA phrase element can be used. This provides a lot of flexibility for you as to where you put your equations. It can be used in your paragraphs, it can be used in your titles and your list items or in your tables and so on. And here in this example of the code that I've shown, um, this is how you would represent the same equation with two different uh, formats. We have a MathML string and an image that would presumably be showing the same thing. And uh, your option there is to provide even more than two. And these appear as siblings within the equation dash inline container. The second equation type is the block equation or the display equation. And um, as you probably already know, this is for equations that are typically set off away from the rest of the text. Sometimes they're centered, sometimes they're left aligned, sometimes you have your blocker display equations numbered, and sometimes not. Um, and did a 1.3, they have introduced a new tag called a div tag, and that's what the equation dash block um, new equation tag is derived from. It's a div tag. And so that can be used um, within a paragraph or before or after a pa paragraph. The div tag is basically it's just a block. And so this um, block can be put where you need it, depending on your requirements. The block equation can also contain a, an equation number, and I'll get into that in just a little bit more detail in a second. Before I move on, I want to point out to those of you who will be using MathML and DITA, um, there, MathML has a separate inline versus block designation. Um, here in DITA, we have equation dash inline and equation dash block. And these are to provide the layout of the equation within the page, while MathML has its own designation for providing the layout information of the equation itself. So um, just for an example here, you can see that we have two summations here. There's one inline and one in the display. In the inline one, it's a smaller sigma symbol, and the limits are in the sub and superscript position instead of in the under and overscript position. The goal here is that when you have an inline equation, you want your equation to be as vertically com compact as possible, so as small as possible, because you don't want the equation to um, add space between the lines of your paragraph. Um, otherwise, that, it just looks funky and ugly. You don't want that. Um, so the reason I mention this is because from the start, at least, there, most MathML rendering engines are not going to be sophisticated enough to, to understand the context of the MathML string and to know that it should render in the inline or block um, rendering. So um, at least to start with, you'll, you'll probably either want to manually include the information, the display attribute that 
tells whether it's an inline or block equation in the MathML itself, or add a script that does it for you. Um, so keep that in mind. Now, the inline and block equations that I just spoke about, those are um, probably going to satisfy most of your requirements. If, if you have an organization that is using the two different equation types, that's probably going to be perfectly fine for you. But the data specification does recognize a third equation type called the figure. And this is intended for your more complex mathematical descriptions. Um, it's derived from the data fig element. And so it allows captions or descriptions in the form of titles, paragraphs, and lists. And the way um, this is done with an equation dash figure element. So here on the left, I have an example of how you might have an equation figure. Um, this is a group of two equations with a description of them, and two numbered equations, I should say. And if you were to insert this in your um, did a document, you might provide a title that has its own inline equations, and then um, the, these two numbered equations. The equation figure does not have to include a, an equation dash block or equation dash inline container, so you can have um, just the equation representation within the equation figure without that container um, if it's a single equation. But um, this equation dash figure is a logical way to group equations if you have something like this, where the second equation logically follows on from the first equation. The data specification for 1.3 now introduces a way to add equation numbers as well. Um, so if you, this is with the equation dash number element. Um, and so if you leave that tag empty, then you are implying that you would like your equation numbers to be automatically generated by your data processor. And if you include contents, that means that you are assigning some sort of number to your equation. Um, now, the data specification provides some guidance to data processors on how to format that equation number. Basically, it says, if you are using a left-to-right language, then the equation number typically appears to the right of the formula and then vertically centered in relation to that formula. Um, but that's just a suggestion, so it's largely left up to the data processor. And right now, um, since this is a, new, a new, completely new thing, um, data 1.3 supporting equation numbers and MathML and mathematics. Um, this hasn't been impl implemented yet, and so it's a big question mark as, as to how data processors will handle this equation dash number element. Um, so that's just something to keep in mind. The specification does, however, suggest that authors, if you are an author, uh, do not include these delimiters when you are including your equation number. So the delimiters here are the parentheses around the number. Um, if you don't include those, the data processor can make sure that all of your equation numbers show consistency in how they're rendered. And that's about it. The equation specialization is very short. It's four new tags for you to keep in mind. Um, so now I'm going to pass it back over to Aaron so that he can explain what MathML is and how you might use that in data. Just one moment. Okay. Okay. So uh, I assume you can see my screen now. Can you? Uh, yes. Okay, great. So, uh, right, MathML. So what is MathML? Uh, in short, it's the, the big block at the top. MathML is XML. It's uh, as simple as that. MathML is a subset of XML, and it's regulated by the W3C. And you can find the entire MathML3 specification with the link on the bottom of the slide. Now, the purpose of MathML is to allow us to display and reuse scientific content in documents and software. And there are two different kinds of MathML. There's content MathML and presentation MathML. So content MathML is focused on the meaning of an expression and is typically used in computer algebra systems. Presentation MathML is focused on describing how to display an equation. Today, obviously, we're focused on presentation MathML. You can see an example of it uh, here on the screen. On the left is the MathML that describes what the MathML should look like, or the beginning of it anyway. 
Um, and on the right, you see what we get after the publishing process. It's a nice, clean-looking equation with proper font spacing and format. So now that you know a little bit about what MathML is and a little bit about how it works, you might be thinking, OK, at the end of the day, you're still just serving up images to the published content. Why don't you just start with the images? Well, at least that's what I thought before I understood all the moving parts in technical publishing. A key point about maximizing your investment in XML is that everything that can be XML should be XML. And by doing that, you can reap all the advantages that the format was designed for. Um, after you get past the implementation, these on the screen are the main advantage of using both XML and MathML. So I'm going to go over them in more detail so as not be so vague. And that first one was separating style from content. Um, so I want to show you an, an example of what style and content together looks like to point out some of the, the bad parts of it. So on my, on my left hand side, you've got content and style in an HTML example. The publishing process is pretty straightforward. You just serve that HTML file to your, uh, your web server and then uh, it's distributed to the devices that ask for it. When you have the content mixed with the style, the publishing process is really straightforward. Um, and if the style is together with the content, then you get the same size web pages on all your different devices. So this particular web page was designed for a computer screen, and it looks very nice on the computer screen. But if we happen to pull it up on a mobile device, because the math has been, rent, has been rendered beforehand along with the other images, before that content's been accessed, uh, the computer see it very nicely, and the mobile device, you either need a magnifying glass to see it, or you need a lot of scrolling to make it actually digestible. Another downfall of putting the style and the content together is that it makes it very difficult to reuse the content. Instead of being able to reference content, uh, you have to copy and paste. Uh, and you can see how that might be a maintenance nightmare. So if we separate the style from the content, uh, then we have our content in one set of documents and our style and our style sheets in another set. So that's going to give you power over presentation. Uh, now, this publishing process can be a little bit more com complicated. And when I sit in the different XML webinars and the presentations that talk about conditional content and things like that, this sort of cloud with all these cartoon people beating on each other is sort of what I think about. Uh, but at the end of the day, it's going to be worth it. Because when you separate the style from the content, you've got more flexibility in your presentation. For example, the math is going to be rendered when the document's loaded. And that means that matching fonts and equations uh, with the text around them is going to be a lot more simple. It makes document-wide changes in formatting a lot easier, and this process can take into account the type of device and the size of the screen. So you can de define different styles based on the locale and the device information passed to you by the publishing process. This is going to give your users a clean-looking uh, math image uh, and the, a clean-looking website regardless of where you are or what device you're using. Next, I want to talk a little bit about localization. So on the screen, you've got a long division example that shows uh, a, an equation for different parts of the world. Um, obviously, different not notation is being used. Um, and if you were publishing a math book with equations like this uh, to each of these locales, and that math book had hundred equi hundreds of equations in it, without MathML, you'd have to make each of the equations uh, three different times for your three different books. Now, with MathML, you create your MathML once and a separate style sheet for each locale. And then you get to reuse that MathML content. Uh, with the style separate from the content, you only need to write the content once and translate variables or words in your equations instead of creating that new image every single time. Uh, another example is if you're publishing to many languages and many formats, that can become a big task. Uh, something as simple as five languages and three delivery formats means you need to decide whether or not to manually recreate 15 equations for each one that shows up in your documents. And it's not hard to imagine that your document doesn't need a lot of math in it uh, in order for that to become a big job really fast. So as you can probably tell by now, one of the biggest themes in XML and thus MathML is reuse. Not only does the separation of content from structure allow the reuse in content on different devices, when you combine that with the data structure, you're able to reuse your topics and equations in different types of documents. MathML is identified as a standard for communicating mathematics, and because of that, there is a lot of interoperability with different products. 
We at Design Science have extensive documentation about the hundreds of products that accept and export MathML. This is important because it allows a technical writer to take the MathML created by an engineer in Mathematica and paste it into a data document created in, say, Oxygen. The same interoperability goes for other computer algebra systems, graphing calculators, assessment tools, and digital whiteboards as well. So it makes it easy for you to print your math once and pick it up and take it wherever you need to go with it. If you're not already making your content accessible, at some point you may run into government legislation that require your documents to be accessible to people with special needs. Uh, we see this a lot in terms of people creating uh, educational documents. MathML is a format of choice for prominent assistive technology like DAISY because it marks up every part of the equation, and that makes it easy for those programs like screen readers and braille translation tools to navigate and translate MathML. And finally, MathML allows better search and replace functionality than other formats, especially images. So if a ratio in a, format, in a formula changes, uh, it'll be a lot easier to find all the instances of that formula to change the ratio if you're using MathML. Otherwise, you have to have a human actually look through all the images in your documents to decide what needs to be changed and what doesn't. Also, research is being done for better math searching. So instead of just looking for the exact text, we'd be able to look for formula patterns. And being able to search formula patterns would allow uh, us to find similar patterns in remote discipline, which uh, could ultimately lead to scientific breakthroughs uh, or unlikely, unlikely partnerships. Uh, if research like this is successful and you're using MathML, you'll better fill your users' needs today and be ready for the future. But it's not all smiles and rainbows all the time. Nothing is, right? So let's talk about the potential disadvantages of MathML. And the first I want to talk about is rendering. Now, Autumn's going to talk a little bit more about rendering, but the main point, point I want to get across is that there's varied support for MathML among different uh, rendering tools. So if you're using a feature that isn't supported, then your equation might not render correctly or at all. Um, and if I wanted to uh, put a, a plug out there, I would say MathFlow, the one that we create, is the one that is up to date with all the MathML in the current version of MathML 3. Now, another issue with rendering is that it's not always consistent among the tools that do support it. So anyone that starts coding in HTML finds out quickly that rendering pages in different browsers can produce different results. The MathML specification has rules for rendering, but there's a lot that's open for interpretation. And because of this, you may see equations rendered correctly in one engine and incorrectly in another. As an example of this, I've used the code on the left in Chrome and Internet Explorer. And you can see the results on the right. And it turns out that the character used for the stretchy arc is not rendering correctly in Internet Explorer. Uh, it can be done, but this is one of those differences between browsers. So uh, next I want to talk about uh, authoring tools. So just like uh, any language, there are different options for authoring. Um, MathML and XML weren't designed to be authored with a text editor, but it can be done if that's the way that you'd like to do it. A lot of scientists learn tech and LaTeX, uh, and they like to stick with that because there's a, a very steep learning curve, but once you learn tech or LaTeX, uh, it can be very useful. So what they'll do is write their research papers or their publications in that language and then convert to MathML uh, using something like MathMagic or MathType. Uh, what we see most often is a designated editor. So if you have an XML editor with your CMS system, or if you're using something like Oxygen or FrameMaker or XMetal, uh, you would integrate with a MathML editor like MathFlow in order to uh, use a what you see is what you get type of editor for MathML. Now, the frustration, just like with any business process, is there might be a productivity J-curve that happens when folks learn MathML. For example, some equation editors allow an author to create a sub or superscript that's not attached to a base. This feature is often employed when an author is trying to stagger a sub and a superscript on the same base, like the example we have below. A MathML authoring system, on the other hand, can allow someone to simply place the end in the preceding example in the superscript position without a base. This would create an invalid MathML string. So the author needs to understand that the end superscript has to be attached to either the base X or the base XN. And until you understand little nuances and rules like this one, the author, authoring experience can be frustrating for folks that are new. So let's talk a little bit about MathML in DITA 
Um, if you're not technical, then you may zone out and check an email for a couple of minutes. I, I understand. I know it's hard to get fired up about this part unless you're working with the XML directly. Um, so what do I mean when I talk about uh, the MathML specializations? I'm talking about the way that the MathML is added to the XML document or the code that's used in the MathML block. So DITA has added a specialization for what a lot of folks have already been doing. They've added the MathML tag as a container for MathML that can be used anywhere that the foreign element is legal. When adding a MathML tag in DITA uh, and you're doing it directly, you need to use the namespace prefix on the MathML string like the example shown and then you can add your MathML string where the ellipsis is. Along with recognizing MathML's valid tag, we also have a few ways to reference external math elements. The first is to reference an entire document. On the left, we have my external.mml file. On the right, I have a sample equation block that I would use to add an equation to my data document. To add the reference, you can see I've added the MathML ref tag inside my MathML block. If you're familiar with referencing XML in general, this should be pretty straightforward. In the next example, I show how to reference a particular element in an external file. So I have created a file with all my MathML equations in it, and I cleverly named it equations.xml. And in it, there's an equation underscore zero two that I'd like to add to my equation block. So I use the same MathML ref tag in my equation block with the same syntax to point to the file, and then I use the hash to call the ID of the math element that I actually want to reference in the external file. If I wanted to put my references at the top of a document that I was working on and then call that reference within the document, I might use a key ref. It's relatively straightforward. You can see the syntax for it here. Uh, the definition obviously is on the left and the reference is on the right. So Adam, if any questions have come up, um, you can call a couple of those out now while I switch over to Autumn as a presenter so that she can talk about uh, the math and math output. Actually, uh Thank you, Aaron. Yes, the first question is uh, was more directed towards Autumn from her first part of her presentation, <clears throat> and the question is how are the two equations aligned <clears throat> on the e equal sign-in uh, with the um, code equation hyphen figure? Oh, that's a good question, actually. Um, so right now, well, it would depend on the uh, processing engine at the at this moment there is no way to do that uh, there's no like um, alignment to happen within the images um, so you would probably want to handle that in a different way such as uh, by providing the equations within a table um, and providing the alignment that way or um, MathML itself has some alignment so uh, you could also do that as a single MathML string and provide the alignment using a Math or MathML's internal alignment. Um, were there any other questions? Thank you, Autumn. Uh, no, not at this time. Okay. Okay, then um, I'll go ahead and get into the MathML output. So, if you do decide to use MathML in your data source, then the um, best way to do that is well to insert the MathML, but then you need to be concerned about how the MathML is going to show up in your output files. So um, we'll go ahead and talk about that and start with the DITA Open Toolkit, which is probably going to be how you're going to process your DITA files at some point. The current version of DITA Open Toolkit, which is 2.0, does not have MathML support. Uh, the MathML support will be coming in a future version of the DITA Open Toolkit, uh, hopefully by the time the DITA 1.3 specification is finalized. Um, so if you are, have urgent requirements for MathML, then um, you will need to do some of your own adaptation to the DITA Open Toolkit. Uh, I suggest you can start with the DITA for Publishers project, which is an open source project. It's a plugin for the DITA Open Toolkit. It's um, been primarily developed and maintained by Elliot Kimber, who is actually the person behind the new math, the new math specializations in DITA 1.3. Before uh, these specializations came about, he had done a basic MathML specialization that was based on DITA 1.2, and so DITA 
for publishers implemented some early uh, support for MathML this way. And the way it does that is um, it, it makes sure the MathML gets passed through during the DITA uh, process, DITA Open Toolkit processing, to make sure that the MathML um, appears in the output so that it can be handled by PDF or HTML rendering engines. Uh, because if you don't do that step, the DITA Open Toolkit will naturally just drop all of the MathML tags and leave you with only the C data, which is not very useful. So it takes care of that, and then it also adds um, some MathJax headers, and I'm going to explain what MathJax is in a second. That's for your HTML output, or HTML-based outputs. Um, so the other thing is that if you know the DITA Open Toolkit fairly well and just need help with these steps, we can help with that. Um, I have some XSL files that will help you do just these two things, and you can, can use those. So um, feel free to con contact me after the meeting or after this webinar. Let's see here. OK, going on to PDF outputs. If you are producing PDF with the DITA Open Toolkit, at some point you will be producing um, XSLFO and using one of these formatting engines, probably. Uh, of these three, formatting engines, Antenna House's formatter is the only one that supports MathML, uh, and they have support for MathML 3.0. Uh, so if you are using Antenna House already, then you are in good shape to start using MathML in your PDF files. If you're not, if you're using Apache FOP, uh, if you are willing to use an older version, then there is a, an open source library called JEuclid, which has a plugin for Apache FOP and can be used to uh, convert the MathML for you before Apache Pop does the processing. So that's a, a pretty easy way to get set up with Apache Pop um, if you're willing to use the older version. But if you're not, if you're using a more recent version of Apache Pop or if you're using RenderX's XCP, then I would suggest you use an independent MathML rendering engine to convert the MathML to an image uh, before passing the XSLFO to one of these formatting engines. And I will uh, tell you a little bit more about your independent MathML rendering engine options in a second. For HTML outputs, you have a few options. Uh, you can just output the MathML into the HTML itself and allow the browser to handle the MathML. Um, as you may know already, MathML is actually part of HTML5, so um, browsers should be and are, will eventually be adding support for MathML. Um, so of these five, unfortunately, the, of the big five browsers, only two support MathML right now, and that's Firefox and Safari to some extent. If you have control over which browsers your audience uses, then this might be the way to go. You can just leave it and let the browsers take care of it, and that's a pretty easy solution. If you don't have control of your browsers, however, the browsers that your audience is using, then your other two options are one is to, again, use an independent rendering engine to convert the MathML to an image before you um, serve up the HTML pages. Or the second option is to use MathJax here, uh, which is a free open source JavaScript library available at mathjax.org, and it renders all the, the MathML in your HTML pages. It works wherever JavaScript works. And the benefit that it has over the image path is that it, um, it actually serves the MathML to the browser, allowing you to realize the benefits that Aaron was just talking about of using MathML in the first place, which means that uh, you, know, you can use the accessibility and make it searchable and so on. Now for your independent rendering engines, you have a few different options again. The, I'll just go through these in alphabetical order. This first one is FMath over here on the left. This is a free library, or free set of libraries, that is in active development, and it does have some MathML 3.0 support. FMath was mostly intended for use on a web server. Um, so this would be a good step. If you have HTML and you don't want to use MathJax, you can use FMath to do the 
um, MathML to image conversion before you put your page up. In addition to the Flash and JavaScript libraries that they have, they also have a Java and a C-sharp library. And the outputs that are available are uh, depend on the library that you use, but they're mostly going to be PNGs and Flash. A second option for you is this JUclid library. This is the one that I was just mentioning that has the Apache Pop plugin. Um, it is a free and open source project. Unfortunately, development on JUclid stopped in 2010. That's why it requires the older version of Apache Pop. And this is why it has no MathML3 support, uh, because development stopped on it before MathML3 became a recommendation. It is a Java-based library. And you can communicate with JUclid uh, through an API or through a command line. But the reason that a lot of people like JUclid is that out of the three of these, it has the largest range of outputs available. It can put out JPEGs, PNGs, bitmaps, and with extension libraries, you can also put out um, output SVGs, PDFs, and flash files. A third um, independent rendering, MathML rendering engine is um, the MathFlow. Uh, well, MathFlow itself is a MathML tool suite, uh, but it does include a library called the Equation Composer that um, will convert the MathML to various image formats. It's available as both a Java and a C++ Windows library, and it, just like JUclid, you can communicate with these libraries through their APIs or through the command line. And the outputs available are the GIF, PNG, and EPS, depending on the library that you're using. As Aaron was saying, uh, MathFlow does have the most advanced MathML support. It is a commercial, it is the only one of these three that is a commercial application. Um, but as Aaron was saying, it has the most advanced MathML support, and the reason for this is that um, Math flow. Uh, so when the W3C, before they make MathML a recommendation, they insist on the specification being implemented in an application before they make, make it a recommendation because they want, you know, they want to ensure that what, what people are saying should happen with these engines can actually happen. So, the MathFlow rendering engine, this Windows Equation Composer rendering engine, was used as the benchmark um, for benchmark testing the MathML test suite. And so that's why it has the, the most advanced MathML support out there and um, high quality output. So that covers the most commonly used tools in the DITA tool chain. Um, and that takes us to our conclusion. To recap what we've talked about, uh, we started with the DITA 1.3 equation specialization. I introduced those four new tags to you. It's a pretty simple specialization. Hopefully it has everything that you could possibly need in DITA. Aaron talked about why you would want to adopt MathML, and pretty much it's the same, for the same reasons that you adopted DITA in the first place, to be able to separate your style from your content, provide cheaper localization options, and to um, be able to reuse the content that you have. And it also offers accessibility and searchability features. Then Aaron introduced the new MathML specialization in DITA 1.3. And again, that's pretty straightforward. There's only a couple of tags that you'll need. If you are going to be using MathML, I provided some output options for you. Um, primarily, those are going to be the Antenna House Formatter, MathJax, FMath, JUclid, or MathFlow. If you should have any questions about how to implement um, MathML in your data workflow, please feel free to contact me at autumn, um, autumncdesci.com desci or my colleague Erin is also happy to help you with your MathML questions. In fact, we'll take your questions right now. Well, thank you so much, Autumn and Erin, for this very informative webinar. <clears throat> The first question that has come in um, is geared towards, is, is directed towards you, Autumn, and it is, which version of Apache FOP supports JUSLID? 
Um, that's a good question. I don't know right off the top of my head, but I could find out for you. Okay. Thank you. The next question has come in is, you spoke about ways to publish math ML, but haven't said much about creating math ML. What are our options there? Aaron, did you want to take this one? Sure. Uh, well, we talked a little bit about options for creating MathML when uh, when I was speaking about uh, the 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 adoption portion in in the frustration section. Um, I, I know that there are a couple. So you can, like I said, create the MathML by hand if you wanted to write XML and, and code it out all by hand in a text editor. Um, there are conversion tools that you can use, as in uh, if you're using another language like Tech or LaTeX. Uh, and you wanted to convert to MathML, you could do that um, using tools like MathMagic and MathType, uh, one of the products that we create. The main one, like I said, that we typically see people using is our MathFlow product. Um, as Anna mentioned, it's the professional product. Um, it's a, a toolkit for uh, authoring MathML and publishing MathML. So it's a, uh, it's a WYSIWYG, which, is, which means what you see is what you get, uh, that allows you to author the MathML and is typically integrated with the XML authoring systems that you would use. Um, like I said before, FrameMaker, um, Oxygen, XMetal, uh, ArborTex, uh, things like that. Or it's also integrated into different CMS systems as well. There are also some free options out there. Um, Autumn will be able to give you a better idea of what all the different free options are. Um, so I'll let Autumn uh, add anything she wants to to that answer. Um, okay. Well, I I don't know. Oh, there are a couple. Yes. Yeah, so Maya is one of them. There's a W3C browser. Um, uh, it's a W3C uh, HTML maker creator that you can use, and that, that has the MathML editor within it that you can copy and paste from. And then um, I think that, that might be the best option for you if you're looking for a free option. Adam, is there another question? Yes, yeah, so thank you very much for answering those, that one. <clears throat> the next question is, there are a number of ways uh, to format an equation number. On your slide, you used 3.6.1, but what if we want to use a single number to represent the equation instead? Is the auto generation of equation numbers going to be customizable? Okay, thank you. That one, um, so again, that is going to be something that is depends on how the, the data processor developers develop that feature. So hopefully it is something that will be customizable. Um, yes, yeah, sometimes people will use, you know, um, chapter.equation number or sometimes they'll use chapter.section.equation number or just the equation number. Um, also the delimiters can change um, or there can be dashes between the numbers instead of dots. So there are a lot of different options for how the equation number can get formatted. Um, it, it just depends on how that's implemented. We don't know yet. Okay, thank you. Um, the last question that's come in at this time is, Aaron spoke about the fact that rendering engines have varying support for MathML3. What kind of features will we be missing out on if we use MathML2 in our data content? Okay. Um, I can probably answer this one as well. Uh, so the main big features that were added in MathML3 um, were support for educational math or elementary math is what I'm thinking of. So for elementary math notation, um, that was kind of difficult to do in MathML2, and it required the use of tables a lot, uh, different rendering engines implemented support for that differently. So, you know, uh, something that you create and align perfectly for one rendering engine might look a little bit different than another one. So that's a little bit uh, something, one big feature that you might miss if you have elementary math notation in your content. Another big feature is the, um, the line breaking within 
equations. So actually, uh, there, there was that question earlier about how to align the two equations in my example. Um, the alignment features are new to MathML 3. And did I just pass it? No, there it is. Okay. So to be able to align this properly uh, with MathML 2, that would require tables as well. And so um, it's, it's just not a very sophisticated way of handling that. It's much easier to do that with MathML 3, which has a, a way of aligning multiple lines. And also it, it specifies, allows you to specify automatic line breaking. So if your equations are really long and you want them to automatically wrap to the next line, uh, that's possible with MathML 3 and it's not poss possible with MathML 2. MathML 3 also introduced right to left um, language support. So those are the three big ones that you would miss if you stuck with MathML 2. And I think that's it. Okay. Thank you so much, Autumn, for that answer. Um, <clears throat> We have some time, so we'll give a couple more seconds to see if there's any last strangling questions that will come in. Um, <clears throat> while we're waiting, just want to let everyone know that um, you will be this webinar was recorded, and you'll be able to view it beginning tomorrow on the our archive on the archive section of the DCL website, which is located at www.dclab.com. Our next webinar will be on Wednesday, January 28th at 1 p.m. Eastern Time. It will be titled, 10 Mistakes When Moving to a Topic-Based Authoring, being presented by Sharon Burton, Content Strategy Consultant. <clears throat> and we'll just give it a couple more seconds just to see if there's any other questions that might come in. In the meantime, thank you both Autumn and Aaron. This has definitely been a very informative webinar. We definitely appreciate the time that you've taken out to present this for us. Thank you, Adam. It's been great being here with you. Great. Yes, thank, thank you. you. Thank you both. Um, with that being said, with no more questions, I'd like to thank everyone for attending, and this will conclude today's webinar. Great. Have a good afternoon. Bye, everyone.